Welcome to episode 162 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Myla de Butterworth, and today we continue with the tales of Odysseus and the story of Odysseus Reveals Himself to the Good Herdsman. Now it happened that in leaving the palace the cowherd and the swineherd met, and close on their heels came Odysseus. He caught up with them just as they closed the door to the forecourt behind them, and said to them in a low voice, I should like to tell you something, my friends, but only if I can rely on you, otherwise I had better keep silence. So first let me ask you something. If a god suddenly brought Odysseus home from alien lands, whom would you side up with? Him or the suitors? Tell me quite frankly. Oh, Zeus on Olympus, exclaimed the cowherd. If my dearest wish were granted, if Odysseus really returned, you should see me fight for him. And Eumaeus too called on all the gods to send his master home. When Odysseus had thus made sure of their faithfulness, he said, Well then, this is what I have to tell you. I myself am Odysseus. After twenty years, after unbearable hardships, I have returned to my native land and find only you two of all my servants ready to welcome me, for I have not heard anyone else implore the gods to send me home. As soon as I have destroyed the suitors, you shall have your reward for this. I shall give each of you a wife and fields and a house built close to my own, and Telemachus shall treat you like brothers." But to convince you that I am telling the truth, I shall show you the scar from the wounded boar once dealt me when I was hunting. With that, he pushed aside his rags and bared the long scar, and the two herdsmen began to weep, clasped their arms around their king, and kissed his head and shoulders. Odysseus kissed them too and said, Do not give way to past grief or present joy, for no one in the palace must know I am here. Let us return to the hall singly. The suitors will not want to give me a turn at bending the bow, but you, Eumaeus, shall take it up boldly and hand it to me. When you have done this, order the handmaids to lock themselves into the women's chamber. No matter what they hear from the hall, shouts or groans, let none of them dare rush out, but let them stay at their work. You, dear Philoetius, shall see to the outer gate, bolt it well, and secure it with a rope. When Odysseus had given these directions, he returned to the hall, and the herdsmen followed him in. Eurymachus was turning the bow this way and that over the fire, but he could not bend it. He sighed and said, This really grieves me, not so much because of Penelope, for there are plenty of other Achaean women in Ithaca and elsewhere, but it is annoying that we should appear so weak compared with Odysseus. Our very grandsons will taunt us with our failure. Antinous, however, reproved his friend for these words. <laughs> Do not talk like that, Eurymachus, he said. Today is the Feast of Apollo, and the holiday is really not the proper time to wage a contest. Let us put aside the bow and go back to our cups. The axes can wait where they are. Tomorrow we shall make an offering to the archer Apollo and try again. But now Odysseus turned to the suitors and said, You do well to rest today. Tomorrow Apollo, the far darter, will, let us hope, grant victory. In the meantime, let me try the bow and see if there is anything of my old strength left in this miserable body. Stranger, shouted Antinous, have you lost your mind or are you drunk with wine? Do you want to start a fight like uh, Eurytion, the centaur at the wedding of Pyrethus? Remember, he was the first to fall, and so you too shall be killed the instant you take the bow in hand, and no one among us will defend you. Here Penelope intervened. Antinous, she said in her gentle voice, how unbecoming it would be to exclude the stranger from the contest. Do you really think that this beggar could bend the bow and claim me as his wife? Surely he himself is thinking of no such thing. It would be quite impossible, so you need not be in the least disturbed. <laughs> what we are afraid of, O Queen, answered Eurymachus, is the gossip that will spread through all of Greece. 
they will say that only inferior men, not one of whom was able to bend the bow of immortal Odysseus, courted his wife. But then in the end, a beggar from heaven knows where, bent the bow effortlessly, and shot the arrow through the twelve axes. <laughs> the stranger is not as base a man as you seem to think, said Penelope. Look well at him, and you will see how tall he is, and how solidly built. Besides, he claims he is the son of a nobleman. Give him the bow. Should he bend it, his only reward shall be a tunic and mantle, sandals, a spear and a sword. When I have given him these, he shall go wherever he likes. Telemachus interposed at this point and said, Mother, no one but I has the right to give or withhold this bow. Even if I choose to give it to this stranger to take with him on his wanderings, no one could prevent me. As for you, go to your chamber, do your spindle and loom, for the bow is the business of men. Penelope heard her son's firm words with amazement, but she did as he said. And now the swineherd took the bow in his hands, and even though the suitors broke into angry cries, "'What are you doing with that bow, you fool?' they roared. "'Are, are you itching to be thrown to your own dogs near the sties?' Eubaeus laid the weapon down in alarm. But Telemachus called in a threatening voice, "'Bring it to the old man. I am the only one who gives orders here. If you do not obey me, I shall drive you out with stones, even though I am much the younger.' The suitor's fury changed to amusement, and they laughed as the swineherd brought the beggar the bow. Then Eumaeus secretly bade Euryclea lock the girls and Philoetius hastened out to the palace and carefully made fast the gate of the forecourt. Odysseus, meanwhile, examined the bow from all sides. He looked to see whether in all the years he had been gone, worms had gotten into the horn, or if anything else had happened to it. The suitors nudged one another, and someone said, "Hm, the man seems to know something about bows. Perhaps he has one like this at home, or else he wants to copy this one for himself. Just look at him fingering it. When Odysseus had examined the huge bow from every angle, he bent it and strung it as easily as a singer strings his lyre. He plucked the string with his right hand to see if it was taut, and it twanged with a high, clear sound, like the tone of a swallow. When they heard it, the suitors winced and grew pale. But Zeus sent thunder down from heaven as a happy omen. Then Odysseus took an arrow, which had fallen from the quiver, and lay on the table before him, gripped the bow, drew back the string, fitted the arrow, and loosed it, aiming with a sure eye. And the shaft flew through every hole of the twelve axes from the first to the last. Then the hero said, Well, Telemachus, the stranger you took into your palace has not disgraced you. My strength, it seems, is unbroken in spite of the taunts of the suitors. But now the time has come to serve these Achaeans their evening meal. Let us see to it before it grows dark, and later we can have lyre playing and singing and whatever else befits a feast. And as he spoke, Odysseus gave his son the sign they had agreed on. Quickly, Telemachus slung his sword over his shoulder, took his spear, and hurried over to his father, armed with gleaming bronze. And here, here's where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.